All right, everybody, welcome to the next Big Rush. I am Fabi, and I have a very special guest today, Steve Mueller. He is like the coolest uranium dentist you've ever met. <laughs> I'll take it. Okay. He's a fellow uh, uranium investor, has been on the thesis for a little while now, right, Steve? Like, how, how long has it been now? Yeah, I was I was not invested for the last bull cycle, but I was definitely studying it, and it was just so confusing. I didn't I didn't put any money into it, but uh, yeah, a handful of years ago, I was like, okay, it's time. It's bottomed, and we're going up. And it, watching yeah. from the sidelines and, and learning, and and, and yeah. Uh, yeah. then <sighs> dipping your toe in, or maybe just jumping uh, straight in <laughs> full yeah. on, yeah. and uh, very very active on Twitter as well. Uh, and you should definitely follow him and see what he's up to because he's a very smart guy and uh, keeps a pulse on the market, like on the daily. He's one of those people that you should definitely befriend him because he'll come out of nowhere with some like fresh news that only came out five minutes ago. How he does it, I don't know. But um, if John quakes, if anything ever happens to him, it's OK. We got a backup. So <laughs> Steve. <laughs> Steve, uh, welcome, and let's start this uh, big picture explanation of why we like uranium so much. So the average person who doesn't yet own any uranium stocks or, or doesn't really understand what the hype is all about, yeah. how how would you explain to them this is the reason why I think it's a good option? Mm. So we went from a, a supply demand story where really it was just the supply was underinvested for too long and the bear market had been too brutal. <clears throat> and we'd gone from a couple hundred companies to where even a duopoly, one of which was state owned because I don't know, couldn't even make it work. The two best companies in the world still could not make it work. And the bear market's so terrible. Um, it's it's my belief, and I, I think we have the numbers now to to back it up that we'll have the probably the best bull market ever. Um so I, I think that's the story, but we <clears throat> there's been a lot lately that is uh, going to make it even better. And I think we're going to talk about that today, uh, just because now it's not just supply that is going down, um, demand is going up. And so that that huge gap is going to take better part of a decade to fill. Um, and they're going to have to spend probably a billion dollars to build the mines they need. So, yeah. Right. So that, that was a lot of uh, like, different facts and very powerful right. statements. So let, let's go down that road. Sure. When we say when we say that there's a supply and demand imbalance, I mean, what are the numbers that, that we're talking here? Um, is it a, like a small supply deficit? Because the numbers I'm looking at, you know, and it, it, it's getting worse and they keep widening and widening and widening. What what kind of numbers are you looking at? And can you even get up-to-date numbers? Because what I've struggled with is things have been changing so quickly in this market yeah. that, you know, every now and again, we see new country coming out with plans for nuclear, another country coming out with extensions for their uh, previously soon to be closed nuclear uh, power plants. And so uh, what are the numbers that you're looking at right now? Um, so, you know, our replacement rate, how much uranium is burned by the reactors that are in, in, in operation right now is about 200 million pounds. Um, next year, it's going to be about 230. And then years after that, because of uh, <clears throat> the extra uranium they need to buy to, to overfeed and enrich, um, it's going to be probably to about 260 million pounds to 300 million pounds um, a year for the, the last couple of years of the decade. So um, those mines just aren't existent. So we're looking at, you know, probably 100 million pounds of, of deficit in some years, at least 70. If you consider that they have to start restocking the inventory that they've been drawing on for the last four or five years. And so. when when we're looking at the supply and demand imbalance, what mm. might not make sense to some people who um, don't really understand the the whole nuclear fuel cycle is okay. So how come there is such an imbalance and the price hasn't already spiked massively ten times over? Is it mm -hmm. because what we are looking at is um, what is used up 
versus what is actually bought in the market? Or is there something more sinister at play? I don't think it's sinister. I, I think it's just a, a system that has gotten a really inefficient communications between their supply chain. Um, I, I know you and I have talked a little bit about the MIT beer game that the management uh, <coughs> college uses to talk about how you manage supply chain. If it breaks for too long, then it's going to affect everybody else. And that's essentially what we've done. Um, the market was kind of balanced. Uh, and then we we went to a whole bunch of extra above ground supply because Japan was shutting down so many reactors. Mm -hmm. And then the U.S. just really made that worse. And like I said, they killed it to where even the two best companies couldn't operate when the, they did the megaton to megawatt program where they were taking Russian nuclear warheads and down blending them into fuel, which I'm all for, but mm -hmm. they did it, I think, in an irresponsible manner. Instead of keeping a strategic reserve, they flooded the market <clears throat> and that caused the enrichers to underfeed and that just made everybody a seller. Um, and so the price went down to $18 a pound when they needed 60, 65 to operate at a, at a you know, replacement rate of production. And so, you know, uh, the supply went way below uh, for way too long. And so now they're going to have to go way above for a lot longer than they're going to want to, too, uh, in order to, to get the mines built that they need. Absolutely. So I think it's just a broken supply chain and and probably just uh, a lot of bad and lazy math by some people that probably should have done better. You know, like the, the fuel <laughs> <consultant>. <laughs> some, so, some smart people that are probably smart on their own, but uh, when put in a room with other smart people get uh, very dumb very quickly. And uh, so just to shed some light on, on the, on the whole um, meg, megaton to megawatt program and, and what that did to the market Essentially, when you have, you know, warhead um, material, what you're looking at is very, very, very in highly enriched uranium, right? So yeah, sure. you're looking at like 90% plus uh, concentration of, of uranium. And when you look at what actually is used for energy generation, it's something around the three-ish to five-ish percent. And so for every, you know, pound of con highly concentrated material that you had, you could produce many, many, many pounds of what can be used in the nuclear fuel cycle. And so, uh, yeah, that was the right move at the time, you know, by the Russians to say, look, we're not going to need to have a nuclear capacity to blow the world 100,000 times over we're fine yeah. with just maybe, you know, a hundred times over. And so in yeah. doing that, uh, because you're going from such a great co concentration, you know, to something that's more usable, that meant that nobody needed to go to the market for a very long time. Right. I mean, and they, yeah. they started this in the nineties, but it was still something that, that lasted a very long time. And, and back then we didn't have the growing demand that, that we have right now. Yeah. Uh, and to see that, you know the two produce the two largest producers. You know the 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 big big names that you see out there, um, Kazadam Prom and Cameco, not make any money from it. It that you know is the red flag of red flags when the most of the market is contained by either uh, private companies that are partly government owned and you can't see you know their books, but you you also know that their motive isn't profit first and foremost because they're government owned uh, and then when you see the public companies uh, one of which is the cheapest uh, producer in the world because Adam Prom you know when they're struggling then then you know that there's something wrong with the whole market because Adam Prom I mean the, the Kazakhs in general hold 40 percent of the market and so if yep. they're uh, if they have a problem then the world has a problem which you know um, has has improved a lot. I mean, they're making a profit, which is great. But mm -hmm. the issue is that the Kazakhs are coming to the market and coming to the utilities and saying, "Look, we have material. We we have great mines, and we we can extract, you know, your material. But it's going to cost more. Our costs are obviously, you know, being heavily heavily influenced by the fact that you know they're in a rough neighborhood to say the least with the war going on and everything and with their uh complicated relationship with the russians 
that doesn't help either. And with the fact that, you know, there's sanctions and everything like that. And the fact that you're talking about a, a geological or body with limitations, right? Mm-hmm. When, when, when the commodity that you're selling is at its cheapest, you have to get the highest grade stuff out of the ground. You have to absolutely get, get the stuff that is going to cost you the least amount of money and sell it so that you survive for that down period. And then hopefully, as uh, all of the noisy neighbors uh, of mine are in agreement with, you ramp up when when the price is right, right? Like you, you go pedal to the metal. Except what we're seeing is that the Kazakhs haven't really been able to ramp up. And I mean, they own the market. Like what what is happening and and how how come if this is such you know a small market how come the market doesn't seem to be able to supply more like what's your take on on the supply constraints that we have right now and going forward yeah so edwards andrea was talking about that this week um brilliant guy everybody should follow him gravedigger capital um and he's he was pointing out that, you know, even more than we haven't spent money on exploration and even more, we haven't spent money on new mines or building mines or care and maintenance or all that stuff. Uh, the biggest part that I think the the, the supply chain's broken uh, with the bear markets killed is actually the, the human capital, the people. There are so few people that are actually going to be able to find uranium, put it in a can and sell it to the market um, at any any time. And so, you know, some of the better companies and better teams, you know, they're, they're now listed at Sprott under key man risk because they're old. <laughs> but, uh, it, you know, they've been slow. They haven't had the money to, to train new guys and they're starting to do it, some of the better companies, but uh, there are few and far between and there's just, it's not been popular, you know, um, in the universities. And so there's just, there's not many geologists, there's not many mine operators, there's not many, you know, all the techs you need. And so I think I think it's going to take a, I think that's going to be the kicker that drives the price to the highest is not the financial players or even the supply and demand. I think it's probably the, the human capital that has to be pulled in. Okay, so, let's yeah. talk briefly about the financial players in this market, mm-hmm. because if I don't know anything about uranium I don't know what that means. What does it mean, Steve, when financial players are coming? Oh, to them? Yeah, that's a terrible term. <laughs> um, so basically, there's some other smart people that uh, have a lot of and resource allocators and all those guys. And they see what you and I see. They see a supply and demand story. And they see that the time has come and that you know certain events are now going to be tailwinds instead of headwinds, like state sponsorship and stuff. And so they they say, hey, uh, the price has to go up and probably soon. So we're going to start putting money to work in order to benefit from that, um, just like you and I want to, right? But they are going to buy uranium and put it into a physical trust and basically short squeeze the market. So, you know, lately in the news past year or so, the, the GameStop short squeeze on the shares was, you know, kind of financial manipulation. And that was, that captured the... I think the whole world's attention because it was such a ridiculous return, you know, like uh, they all had multi and stuff. Um, but these, these smart guys and some of these, you know, uh, hedge funds and, and corporations, they know that they can squeeze the market by just putting a little bit of money to work. And it's just a really safe bet for them. And so uh, we've gone from just having two physical funds to, you know, we're looking at at least seven over the next year and a half. That are coming to market. So I, I can't even fathom where the the price of uranium can go if even you know like five uh financial vehicles are in the in the market buying up pounds. And I mean there is a supply and demand balance independent of these guys coming in with all their millions to buy up material, right? I mean, you can only imagine if they can actually uh, squeeze the price uh, where that can go. And so I don't really make any predictions regarding price, but I want to hear what you have to say, because I know that w- what your predictions 
are 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 probably you know on the wild side compared to me i'm just i'm just yeah. gonna like put it out there so here's what i yeah. think yeah. i think that personally uh, if i see that we've reached the uh inflation adjusted high of the last bull market which now would be about uh 200 per pound mm. then i i'd be like okay you know like job done you know, I was right, kind of thing. This is my victory lap. You know, it it, it was eighteen. I was here. It's two hundred. I'm still here. And and then I'd be like, okay, this 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 was something that you know I was able to ride um, a good chunk of. What are your price uh, predictions or thoughts? And where do you like how how high do you think this could actually go with what we know right now? I think the sky's the limit, depending on how vicious the the short squeezing financial players want to be um, because it's just going to take so many years to, to get that material. Um, that's not helpful for setting an exit strategy, which I would encourage everybody to do your own homework and uh, get to know the space. But um, the two things I'm looking at is that the spot price always goes above the swoop price, usually about 10, 15%. Um, in the 70s and in this last bull market in 2006, 7, 8, 9. But uh, so if we do that again, you know, yeah, we're we're well above 200 because um, it's already at 186 or something, you know. And then uh, the other thing I'm looking at is the clearing price last time to balance the market was about $62 a pound. Um, <clears throat> and now that clearing price is over 90 today. But by the time a lot of these mines will be built in two to three years from now, four years from now, um, you know, if you just say, oh, another three percent inflation for those four years, you're you're pretty much at one hundred dollars a pound. Right. But, you know, we were at sixty dollars a clearing pound and we went to one thirty five, I think. Um, so more than twice as high. So there again, we're, we're kind of looking at, oh, yeah, probably over two hundred dollars a pound probably seems pretty fathomable. I mean, that would be normal bull market stuff. and none of the bull markets have ever had this many tailwinds as this one does. Um, and that's even, you know, if we don't sanction Russian uranium completely, you know. And I was um, just going to say that's without any sort of like, you know, out of left field crises, you no know, without a mine shutting down, without um, Kazakhstan, you know, I don't know having a yep. political uprising and, and not being able to ship material whatsoever without any of these like crazy scenarios. Like that's just what, what we're seeing. And uh, just to clarify, um, we mentioned price of SU or Steve mentioned price of SU. So SU is um, process material, right? Let's, let's say that you have uh, three different stages. It's a little bit more than that, but let's not get into the technicals here. Uh, sure. You you have the yellow cake, which is the stuff that we uh, mine. Mm -hmm. We pull out of the ground and we process it to a certain extent. And then we have yellow cake, which is actually yellow. That's why we call it yellow cake. Um, then you have uh, UF6. And then you have um, you have the, the next step over, which SU is the actual service of producing that next step over. So it's something that we keep in mind. Because that's where the market is the tightest. And we know that, that if downstream the market is tight, they're eventually going to need to to go upstream and, and get more and more material. That is, yeah, I get it. I get, gets bigger at the bottom. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. And we, have, we haven't even mentioned um, anything about underfeeding or overfeeding. Would you like to go into that? <laughs> I don't know. That's helpful. I, you know, it's, it's kind of like you have a, a car engine or a play or motorcycle engine, you can run the engine, a gas engine, you know, rich or lean, depending on what type of power you want, depending on how much oxygen you can get into the engine, all that stuff. It's kind of, it's kind of similar. Um, they've been for a long time and using less fuel um, because they had to be a seller too, because everybody else was a seller. Now that everybody's going to be a buyer, they're also buyers, these enrichers, um, very large buyers actually. And uh, so now they're having to run rich to get it out faster, to, to get the end product to, to, to the utilities to, to put in the nuclear power plants. So 
uh, not to get too complicated, but that's that's kind of how I think about it. Is that they've been running lean and now they never rich, and so now somebody that was a seller is now a buyer. But it's just tens of millions of pounds different in in the outcome. And you can go to yourinco.com. They have a SWOO calculator, and you can play with the numbers and you can see at the tails that we hear that they're running are going to be running the next three or four years. They need about 37% more uranium feedstock than they did a couple of years ago. Um, That's a big swing. Good luck to them for finding it. They're going to have to, they're going to have to fund the build of a lot of mines that, yeah, still in planning stages. So. Yeah. Okay. So a uh, couple of things to wrap up. So first part is playing the devil's advocate here. If sure. this story is so strong, how come the equities aren't really going anywhere? That's something I hear from like mm. mining industry veterans, like people who follow mining in general and they never got into uranium or they didn't got burned. It happens yep. to all of us. And yep. then they're yeah. like, it's never going to happen. I've been hearing this story for years. Why now? What do you say? Yeah. Um, you know, Primarily, they are equities, which means there's you know stocks and so capital flows and things like M2 money supply falling at the fastest rate, you know, in 100 years. That's having a, a huge effect on us. And um, you can either, yeah, you know, it's just it's miserable. Like I don't like being down, you know, um, but I'm down. And I, you know, I'm humble about that. Uh, the market says I'm wrong, but eventually, you know, they'll they have to fund us because it has to come from somewhere, right? And that's just going to take a much higher price. And so eventually it will work. Um, I think that happens later this year. Um, but, you know, the the longer it happens, the higher the spike is going to be and the more rapid it's going to be. And so I, I think they've reached the point now where it's going to be a pretty awesome spike. So <clears throat> that's just the math. It, you can't you can't escape the math. You can ignore the consequences until you can't. And we're we're close to that point. Yeah, there, there's that little last drop that makes the cup overrun, uh, you know, with liquid. It's just like every single drop is important, but it's that last one that you see. And then all of a sudden it does happen, right? Just because it it hasn't panned out in the way that people uh, wished it did. It, that doesn't negate the actual fundamental thesis of where this is going. And the other thing I'd like to remind everybody is there is no substitute, unlike some base metals. And some rare earths, even there is no substitute for uranium. You cannot mm. grab thorium and put it in <laughs> your reactor. It doesn't work like that. Unfortunately, it'd, it'd be nice for us to have, you know, energy uh, supply from different sources that were very easily transferable. I think it would be good for the world uh, as a whole, but it, that's not the way it works. I think we and, get there in twenty-five to thirty years. I, I do. Yeah, I th I think eventually, but but that eventually uh, we'll be investing in in all sorts of different things by the time that that we get to that stage. And so, Steve, uh, let let us know, let us understand a little bit more of okay, if I am interested in this whole uranium thesis, I get it. Supply and demand imbalance. I'm gonna go do my homework. Uh, where should I look, or how should I start looking at companies? How do I invest? Do you like, sh should people invest in, in juniors? Uh, I mean, explorers or developers, producers? Uh, what about those physical vehicles that you mentioned? Yeah, if if you haven't spent thousands of hours of the homework yet, I would probably just say it's just safest to stick with a ticker like URNM, which has some physical and some miners and, and some blue chips. Or maybe even URNJ, just because at today's prices, when we're filming, it's just ridiculously cheap. And, and they're the ones that have to go up the most. And so that's just as an easy ticker. It's liquid. Um, I think there is a lot of extra gains to be had, a lot of alpha to doing your own work, picking the very best companies. Um, and, you know. Personally, I'm, I have a lot of developers, a lot of the juniors that will have to become producers over the next couple of years, but I have some explorers too. And I, I don't necessarily recommend that. <laughs> they're, they're all burning cash right now. Like they're, none of them have cash flows. And so they're terrible businesses, but eventually they're going to have to get paid to, to bring to market what they have. 
Um, but you know, yeah, you, you look at people that won in the past. I, I'm a big believer that you, you want to find successful people um, that have integrity. And so like maybe go and watch old interviews. I, I have a lot and say, hey, did they do what they said they were going to do? You know, that's that's important, that integrity and the ability, not just integrity to to want to do it, but to actually succeed in doing it and getting it done. Um, it's pretty rare. And I, you know, there, gosh, when I think you and I started looking at this space and, and investing in it, there was a little less than 50 companies and now we're at 119, 120, I think this week. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I really think a dozen, maybe 15 are, are probably worth a punt. And yeah. so it's hard to pick those. And so if you don't want to spend the time, I understand you just, just buy the ETF, but and you'll 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 be very happy with your gains, right? Uh, yeah. And you know that's that's very time efficient. But I, I think you can you can do really well. Like I know you have um, by by picking the winners and getting to know the space and stuff. But that that takes a lot of time. And you and I have put a lot of time into this. So. So we do. That, yeah. I mean, fun. if you if you if you want the gains, you got to put in something, right? <laughs> time, yeah. Yeah. money, energy. Yeah, but I would encourage and risk. everybody to to put the work into understanding the fuel cycle and the thesis and the different factors that go into supply and the different factors that go into demand. Um, just so you have the conviction to ride the volatility because it's the volatility is up there with cryptocurrencies. It's just that's stupid. It's pretty insane. Yeah, I, I get asked a lot this uh, this question of hey, like why aren't the shares moving? Why aren't the stocks moving? And I'm like. Hmm. That's the whole point of investing in mining. First of all, you have to understand what category of the thing you're buying uh, mm. belongs to, right? And so if, if you're buying an exploration company that's still looking for uranium, then guess what? The fact that it has uranium uh, on its name doesn't mean it has any uranium, but it's positioned, right? And mm. looking for uranium, that's good. It's you know within, within the sphere of uh, uranium companies, uh, but... The game for them is to go from having zero pounds to finding something, right? To finding uh, a resource. And you don't even get started in, in thinking of how economic this is going to be, you know, down the road. We don't know that. So too many unanswered questions. Uh, but the other thing is that the, the price of the commodity and the stocks never correlate 100%. Like they never move in tandem. That's not how stocks work. And that's not how mining stocks work. Sometimes you have such small companies with such thin liquidity that, you know, one of the financial backers like gets a divorce and sells his shares and like crashes the stock completely. Like that's what we're talking about. This is the level of professionalism. That's behind, you know, the 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 structure of some of these companies. It it just is, right? It, it's the wild, wild west. The same way that you have, you know, tiny little companies uh, in California that you've never heard of that are startups and never went anywhere. There's something similar in the Canadian and Australian uh, stock markets for mining. It's just that it's public, and so we yeah. see, you know, the failures, and it, it's, you know. It's our risk. It's not a VC's uh, risk, you know, to put money in. And so tread carefully, but do look into this thesis because it it is something that uh, I've been pounding the table on for a long time. I have made decent gains from coming in uh, and knowing what I like to buy. Obviously, there's there's some stuff that just doesn't work the way that we want to, but if you think this is something that you're interested in, that you've been hearing about and, you know, you want to understand more of, then uh, when you look below here, you're going to see uh, our social media and uh, you're going to be able to follow us and see what we're thinking. See, sometimes we even talk about the stuff that we own, you know, <laughs> disclaimer. <laughs> uh, but Steve, thank you so much. Uh, I hope that everybody who is out there listening to this and doesn't yet own any uranium stock, at least come to the understanding of what the opportunity is. Because if we're right and we could be wrong, there's always that chance. If we're right and, and this thing plays out remotely in the way that we think it's starting to play already, then we don't want people to miss it because we didn't actually you know explain 
the thesis in plain English. So this is your chance. This is it. This this is you. This is the call for the train. And uh, if you're ready, come follow us. Steve, thank you so much. Thanks, Fami. Good luck. Hope to speak to you soon.